Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are around the world. Welcome to uh, this second edition of the Sciences Po Mayor Brown Arbitration Lecture. My name is uh, Danny Hayat. I'm a partner at Mayor Brown. I had the international arbitration practice, and I am extremely glad to welcome you to this uh, event co-organized, as I mentioned, between Sciences Po, the Sciences Po Law School, and Mayor Brown. It is a pleasure to have you here. Of course, it is disappointing that we cannot see you. You can see you can see us, but we cannot see you. We do not see your faces. We cannot see your expressions. But we know that you are here because we know that you have there are approximately 300 of you that have registered to this event. So thank you to all of you for being here. As I mentioned, it is a pleasure for us. We were supposed to have this event in May, but of course, the circumstances led us to postpone it. We thought that we would be. Uh, physically present with you in September. Unfortunately, it's still not the case, but we are resilient and we adapt as all of you and uh, so in a different format, but nevertheless able to reach out to a more global audience. Um, we like doing intellectually stimulating um, debates and, um, and events. And Sciences Po, of course, is well known for um, doing intellectually stimulating events, courses and uh, teaching courses to the, to the students and at Mayor Brown. I think our practice, our, our, our team um, enjoys what we're doing, and we think that we've been doing intellectually stimulating um, 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 cases for the, past, for the past 20 years or so. Today is another example of what can be intellectually stimulating when we gather forces between Sciences Po and Mayor Brown, and thanks to all of you who are participating. Allow me to um, leave the floor to uh, Professor Diego Fernandez Arroyo from the Sciences Po Law School. Thank you, Diego, for being with us and please introduce the rest of today's event. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Danny. Uh, for us, as a Science Po Law School, it's really a pleasure to share this initiative with Maya Brown, but it's also very good to have behind us uh, our young generation of Science Po Arbitration Society, uh, whose president is here, Alexander Semilasnik, and Today is a special occasion, the second edition of this Science Po Mayor Brown Arbitration Lecture, in which we have uh, maybe the most influential French uh, professor of the last generations in both fields, private international law and international arbitration. There's Pierre Mayer here. Uh, I, I know that you know very well Pierre Mayer, but let me say, uh, insist, uh, on, on this point that the influence of the scholarship of Pierre Mayer. Um, most of the young professors and practitioners today in France and abroad uh, claim to be Pierre Mayer's uh, disciples. And, and they say that uh, actually they written PhD dissertations under the supervision of Pierre Mayer. And we believe that. And uh, as far as we can know the, the contribution of all those young uh, scholars. Actually, the thought, the Pierre Mayer thought, are behind of all those professors and practitioners. And then we are very happy to have Pierre to deal with a so sophisticated and difficult topic as justice. Uh, justice should be the most common of the words for a lawyer, but when we talk about arbitration, it becomes a little bit rare. It, it is strange. Uh, many people claim that, uh, claim that arbitrators only must apply what the parties have decided, selected, without any uh, room for flexibility, for imagination, for uh, looking for justice. And Pierre Mayer will deal with this topic, but not me. And Pierre, thank you very much for being here, and the floor is totally yours. Thank you, Diego, and uh, my thanks to both organizer, organizers on, on, on both sides, Sciences Po and uh, Mayer Brown. Uh, good afternoon for those who are here, and for all the people uh, behind their screens, except maybe for some to, which I must say, to whom I must say uh, good morning. Um, so the topic is, must justice be a goal for the arbitrator? This question immediately raises another question, and a, and a vast one. What do I mean by justice? Because justice is a polysemic term. 
when philosophers debate about justice, they generally do it from a social political perspective. And in that perspective, without embarking in, in philosophical considerations, one might say, for instance, very trivially, there is no justice when there are people who struggle all their life to earn very little, while others who have never worked in their life live in luxury. That is social political. But of course, has nothing to do with any possible goal that the arbitrator may have. So we must limit ourselves to meanings which are relevant to arbitration, or even, as we will see, specific sometimes to the process of adjudication. Even if we focus on what justice may mean for an arbitrator, several notions may come to mind. In fact, when I thought of this subject that was uh, probably one year ago, uh, two notions uh, went to my mind, came to my mind, which I thought deserved to be considered. Uh, there was a third one, but I thought it did not raise any interesting problem. Uh, until recently, I was confronted, as many arbitrators currently are, with justice in an elementary sense. Justice in the sense of the word, the word in the expression, Ministry of Justice, the public service of justice. What is justice in that sense? I would say it's an activity which consists for a third person, a judge or an arbitrator, in resolving a legal dispute between two or more parties by deciding at the end of a certain process what are their respective rights and obligations. Rendering justice in that sense is the fundamental task of the arbitrator, as it is for the judge, and, well, apparently cannot generate any tension. If you are an arbitrator, you must render an award, full stop. There is therefore not much to say, but something still. In these times of COVID, attention has appeared in a specific circumstance, which I can describe. It had been agreed between the parties and the arbitrator that the hearing would take place in person in a certain place. And it now appears that it would be dangerous or even impossible to convene in that place or any other place. Then it happens that the claimant says the hearing must be held now remotely because it's impossible to hold it otherwise. But the dates have been fixed long ago. But the respondent says, no, 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 no. The uh, hearing must be postponed uh, because it must be held in person. That's the only rational way to do it. En présentiel, as we say in modern French. Many hearings which should have taken place in spring were postponed because everybody thought that the virus would have disappeared uh, at the end of summer or in autumn. And a hearing in person is generally much to be preferred, at least in big cases, to a hearing by video conference. But now the situation is different. We do not know how long the crisis will, will last. It can be very long. And here comes into play justice in the elementary sense that I have defined. It appears as a sacred goal for the arbitrator because justice indefinitely delayed is justice denied. So in most cases now, the hearing will not be delayed and it will be held, unfortunately I would say, uh, by video conference. But this is, in fact, a parenthesis. Uh, hopefully, it's exceptional, it's temporary, and I leave this sense of the word justice, which only entails that the award must be rendered, must exist, to concentrate on something more interesting, on the content of that award. Must it be just? 
is rendering a just award an important goal for the arbitrator? That's the real question. It is nowhere written in the law that an award must be just. Worse, a manifestly unjust award will most often be recognized and enforced. Nevertheless, everybody will agree the arbitrator must render a just award or at least must strive to render a just award. It's a moral imperative. But what does one mean by a just award? It may be simpler to say that an unjust, unjust award is an award, for instance, that orders the respondent to pay 1 million euros to the claimant, while in reality, it owes the claimant nothing. That award is unjust, which leads us to a first definition of a just award, very simple, an award, the content of which is in conformity with reality. By the way, uh, you will maybe disappointed, be disappointed, but there will be nothing philosophical in my speech. Uh, it's only, uh, it only rests on my experience in arbitration, as an arbitrator, and the problems I met. That's the starting point for my reflection. So, that first definition corresponds to a goal for the arbitrator, undoubtedly. But the real question is, to what extent will it guide the arbitrator in the course of the proceedings? That's the question which I will ask myself in the first part of my presentation. But this is not all. Justice has another meaning, for which the term equity might also be used. It is often said, summum ius, summa inura. Inuria. Uh, summum ius, that's justice as I've just defined it. Summa injuria introduces another just notion of justice, equity. To what extent can justice in the second sense be allowed to interfere with justice in the first sense? That will be the object of the second part. Before starting with the first part, one precision. I will leave aside arbitration ex equo et bono, which first is extremely rare, even in countries in which it exists, does not exist in many countries, and it raises different problems. The first part, the main goal, rendering an award in conformity with reality. That goal may be seen as an application of Aristotle's definition of justice, sum in, in Latin, sum quique tribuere, to grant to each person what is due to that person. That's the first sense of justice, at least in this speech. How does the arbitrator determine what is due to the parties or from one party to the other? He or she must ascertain the facts and correctly apply the, the applicable law to these facts. Just a pause, I said he or she, because there are men and women arbitrators. But although I tried, it's impossible to say he or she every time. So you will understand when I say he or his that I have in mind men and women arbitrators. Professor Rusty Park has given the following definition of a just award. An award which is based on what really occurred between the parties and on the relevant legal norms. And essentially, I agree. Every arbitrator tries to achieve that result, but it cannot always be reached because there are often obstacles. And I will mention three. The first one cannot be overcome. And if I mention it, it's only because it leads us to a slightly different definition of a just award very close to that of Rusty Park, but 
but slightly different. The other two give rise, give rise to a tension between the aspiration of the arbitrator to justice and certain duties which are or would be imposed on arbitrators. The first obstacle is to sim simply the lack of evidence. For instance, the claimant A has lent a thousand euros to his very good friend B, and now he claims it back. He did not ask his friend because he's a very, very good friend and honest, apparently, to sign a paper. But now he wants his money back. B refuses. So A sues B. And the two agree to appoint an arbitrator. But B still denies having received the sum. And A is not able to prove the loan. So A's claim will be dismissed. Is justice achieved? In a general sense, obviously not. The dishonest borrower will keep the money which he had promised to reimburse to his excellent and generous friend. That's injustice as much as you can imagine. But from the perspective of the normal functioning of arbitral adjudication, justice has been achieved. No one expects the arbitrator to be omniscient. For the arbitrator, as for the judge, there is no absolute truth. One speaks, sometimes, of judicial truth, or more correctly, in the field of arbitration, jurisdictional truth, which differs from ordinary truth. Ordinary truth is the adequacy of a description of facts to what the facts really are. Jurisdictional truth is the adequacy of a description of facts limited to the facts that can be proved. So we have to adapt the notion of arbitral justice to the notion of jurisdictional truth. An award achieves justice if it is based on jurisdictional truth and, of course, a correct legal reasoning. But a confusion must be avoided here. When I say jurisdictional truth, I do not mean the truth based on the facts as they were actually established in the case. Because suppose the arbitrator refused for no good reason that a certain piece of crucial evidence be submitted, the result is no truth at all, not even jurisdictional truth. Jurisdictional truth is something more abstract. It includes the fact for which there is evidence that is available, that is offered, and that is uh, uh, admissible. And if for some bad reason or for no reason at all, the arbitrator refused to accept that evidence, which much might have changed the outcome of the case, the award, award will not be a just award arbitral justice will not be achieved. Another obstacle may result from the lack of skills of counsel. What may or must the arbitral, arbitrator do if counsel for one party misses something important? For instance, and that's an, an example which is taken from my experience, there is, in the litigious contract, a certain clause which none of the parties has mentioned. And the arbitrator thinks that it might well change completely the outcome of the case. He's not absolutely certain. Maybe he's wrong, but the appearance is that he's right. Therefore, the arbitrator would like to draw the attention of the parties to that provision and hear them on its possible relevance. What drives him is the fear of rendering an unjust award. Will he order the respondent to pay $100 million, which are claimed, to the claimant, while maybe he should dismiss the claim? There is a big debate on this issue. It was discussed last year, among other topics, at a colloquium organized by the Camera Arbitrale di Milano. Half the participants said, 
The arbitrator should never ask the question. The elements of the disputes are brought by the party, exclusively by the parties. It would be a shocking intrusion of the, on the part of the arbitrator. And in addition, this such intrusion would necessarily be in help of one of the parties, and that's contrary to the sacred principle of neutrality of the arbitrator. That view was shared uh, mostly by participants from the common law. Participants from the civil law were in the majority of the opposite view. What separates the advocates of these two views is their respective understanding of the notion of jurisdictional truth. One view is that jurisdictional truth is the result of a kind of game or a fight between the council, in which, of course, much depends on the skills of the council. If council for one party has missed something essential, it means that the party has made a bad choice and justice commands that it lose. My friend Paul Friedland, the head of the arbitration practice at White and Case, has defended this view quite eloquently. I quote from an article he wrote in the bulletin of the Association Suisse d'Arbitrage. Stepping forward to do the which may have failed to meet its burden of allegation or persuasion will often I would even say usually do an injustice. There is usually no good reason why a party that made a poor choice of counsel should be relieved of the burden of its choice. I must say that I totally disagree. First, my understanding of where justice lies is not that justice is done when the party which should prevail based on the fact and on the law, loses because of the lack of skill of its counsel. Of course, it's sometimes inevitable, but if something can be done so that the party which should win, wins, that is more in conformity with my notion of justice. I would add that sometimes a party is at a disadvantage because it cannot afford to hire the expensive counsel which would really good, do a good job. As to the notion of jurisdictional truth, I do not see why it should necessarily be the exclusive result of the fight between counsel and why the arbitrator should stay mute. The arbitrator knows the case, the case at his, as, as it has so far been submitted by the parties, is supposed to be someone competent, at least he thinks he is, he enjoys the trust of the parties, and his role and desire is to achieve justice. Why should he keep for himself the questions which he finds relevant in order that justice be achieved? One answer is, it's the party's case. They have the right to present it as they see fit. No one denies that it's the party's case. The arbitrators will never win nor lose. No one denies that the parties present their case as they see fit. And I even agree that if they want to limit the scope of the dispute to their own arguments, they can. They can, but they don't. But they don't. And there's no reason to think, unless they had said it expressly, that they wish the arbitrator to stay mute. And no authority of any sort imposes that passive attitude on the arbitrator. An attitude which is not imposed on courts, at least in civil law countries. It is, in fact, a postulate. And we must ask ourselves, what is the value of that postulate? On one side, it may lead an arbitrator to render an award which he himself considers to be contrary to justice. What is there on the other side? The fear may be of appearing partial, but such a fear is misplaced. The arbitrator is only looking for the truth, is trying to do justice. His first 
purpose is not at all to favor one party. And in fact, if he stays mute, he favors the party which should not be favoring and maybe should lose if the question is asked. So I see no other argument in favor of a postulate than the, than the following, a certain tradition in the courts of certain countries, which in these countries, as I know from having spoken to very high judges in these countries, is less and less respected there. For me, very simply, jurisdictional truth must bear as much resemblance as possible to the actual truth. So, to come back to my example, where the arbitrator is seriously wondering he has missed an important clause in the contract, I would say that not only he may, but even he must ask the question. He will get an answer. Maybe his intuition was wrong, but he will know. Now, there are other situations in which it may be more difficult for the arbitrator to intervene and distinctions have to be made. In my example, the issue is one of interpretation of the contract. I don't see any obstacle. Another issue arises uh, and concerns the identity of the applicable law or the content of the applicable law. No obstacle either, I think, to raising the issue. An argument has been expressed in what maybe is not the most convincing way. Well, there may be ways for the arbitrator to make the party understand that its reasoning must be, might be improved. The, the arbitrator may ask questions which will more or less guide the uh, party. I'm coming now to the third and last obstacle. Procedural rules that limit the possibility for the parties to submit new evidence, essentially documents or arguments, after a certain stage of the proceedings. It is generally mentioned in procedural order number one that each party must make, must make all its arguments and submit all its evidence in its first submission. New arguments or evidence in the second submission are only admissible if they are triggered by the other party's submission. This rule is very often violated. And then the, the other party requests that the new elements be struck from the record. I have never seen such requests granted. The arbitrators want to have the full picture because they want to render a just award. That's their main goal. It prevails over the rules which they have themselves established. There is more he hesitation if a party seeks to introduce new evidence after the last memorial has been filed between the rejoinder and the hearing. This is normally impossible, save for exceptional circumstances, if that's what procedural order number one says. But sometimes the circumstances are not really, really exceptional, although it is claimed that they are. The new documents were in the possession of the party and were simply negligence. Or there was a change, a change of strategy, possibly because the party realized that uh, its counsel was not good, it changed counsel, and the new counsel has a different uh, vision of the case. What should the arbitrator do? On the one hand, rules are made to be abided by, and it would be shocking that permission be granted in square violation of the rule. Also, if generalized, a laxist attitude would mean the disappearance of any rule. On the other hand, if the arbitrator has the feeling that the new element may be important, he's tempted to accept it. While, of course, giving the other party the possibility to react, even in writing, if necessary. In my experience, 
it is not rare that arbitrators adopt the second attitude. They make considerations of substantive justice prevail over considerations of procedural justice. Are they right? Are they wrong? I do not feel able to give a general answer. The answer may depend on various factors. The nature of the documents, they are more or less serious relevance and materiality to the case. Imagine, for instance, a party says, I've discovered in the archives that the case was settled by my predecessors. That's very important. Um, also, how to understand the notion of exceptional circumstances. Uh, there may be different interpretations, etc. So, not committing to myself too much, I would say that one should not be too strict, but not, one should not be too permissive. Notwithstanding all these obstacles, it remains clear to me that the main goal of the arbitrator is that his award be in harmony with the facts and the law. But that is only in the first meaning of the word justice. What about another meaning and another goal which would interfere with the first? I come to my second part rendering an award in conformity with equity. The arbitrators at the time of deliberation or the sole arbitrator at the time of drafting the award sometimes has the feeling that the award based on proven facts and rigorous application of the applicable law is in the second sense of the word unjust, inequitable. It may be because the, situ the situation of the losing party would be too harsh and the arbitrator would like his award to be softer. It may also be that the solution to which he arrives is not reasonable, is contrary to what common sense dictates. These are two different aspects of equity, but I'll cover both. I will first ask myself whether equity is the real goal of the arbitrator. Having answered in the negative, I will then examine whether there are sometimes ways to avoid an unfair, inequitable result. Is equity the real goal of the arbitrator? I suppose that today not many specialists of arbitration would answer positively. Remember that I have excluded arbitration ex equate bono. However, I would like first to put that in a historical perspective and second to confront the theory with reality. Arbitration has long been considered, I would even say initially considered, as a kind of justice alternative to public justice and based on equity. That was the view of Aristotle, who opposed justice and equity, and considered that arbitration by its nature aims at equity. Well, that's centuries ago. You will be surprised to hear that there were authors in the years 80s and 90s of the 20th century who professed the same view. I will call, quote first René David, the great comparatist, who in his book on l'arbitrage dans le commerce international wrote the following, I, I translate. We reject as foreign to practice and unfounded as a principle the distinction between arbitration pursuant to the law and arbitration in accordance with equity. The concern of arbitrators in conformity with the will of the parties is to arrive at a, I say it in French, solution de justice, rather than to strictly apply the law of a given state. And clearly, solution de justice here means equity. That was uh, in 1982. In 1997, Professor François Théry concluded his speech before the Association Française d'Arbitrage with the words, and I translate again, I beg you 
a little less law, a little more equity. Was that view specific to arbitration as opposed to state justice? Maybe not. According to Jean-Denis Bredin, the judge, as well as the arbitrator, is only inspired by equity. He wrote the following, I'll try and say it again, in the uh, Mélange, Gold, Mélange en l'honneur de Bertolt Goldman in 1982. What characterizes the judge today is a stubborn and subconscious effort to reduce the law to a strict minimum. The source of the law for the judge is his mind, his morals, his ethics, his culture, his class, his caste, all which he calls equity. I'm wondering whether there may be some truth in this analysis. Concerning the judge, rather than the arbitrator, contrary to the view generally held. I, th I say this because I have been involved as co-arbitrator in two arbitrations chaired by a judge. Of course, it's a very limited experience. I'm perfectly aware of that. In one of these two arbitrations, the president, a high judge, very high judge, summarized the case in the following way. These claimants, an old couple of Italians, of course, their claim does not hold, but they are so charming. And also their counsel, as you saw, was terrible. And the other party, the counsel, so arrogant. So we should give them something. Not all that they claim, but something. And we count a new professor appointed by the bad party to find the best possible reasons for our reward. In the other case, I was sitting with two very high judges, one of them being the chairman. They agreed that although the claimants were right, the arbitral tribunal should not give them the whole amount claimed. Why? Because the respondent, a public entity, was in a very difficult financial situation. And they cut the claim by half over my protest. I'm not saying, of course, that all judges would reason in that way, whether as judges or as arbitrators. And I will add that I have never witnessed anything like that with arbitrators who were not judges. Maybe the judge who every day applies the rules of law uh, becomes blasé, the prestige of the law has diminished, and they count more and more, they are more and more confident in their ability to find where justice lies. Well, I do not think that I have to demonstrate that equity as a guide prevailing over the law is extremely dangerous. Of course, my two examples are extreme, and it cannot even be said that they were truly inspired by a sense of equity. But more generally, what the contracting parties expect in case of a dispute between them is that the arbitrator applies the law and the contract. First, they do not trust his sense of equity, which gives them too much liberty and may lead to arbitrary decisions. Dieu nous garde de l'équité des parlements, may God save us from the equity of parliaments, was a common saying in France at the end of the 18th century. And secondly, the parties want to be able to predict the outcome of the dispute. If they know which rules will be applied, there is at least some predictability, and often on that basis they will be able to settle. If it's uncertain which role equity will play, each of them thinks it has a chance and try its luck in arbitration. However, 
there are situations in which the injustice would be so flagrant that the arbitrator will try to find a legitimate way to avoid it. So I come to the limited role of equity. The injustice may result from the law or from the contract. The law first. It is in fact rare that the law leads to an unjust result. The lawmaker has justice in mind. But it sometimes happens that the objective of the law is not to regulate the relationship of the parties in the most equitable way, but from a more general perspective, the objective is to deter certain behaviors which are considered particularly undesirable. One typical example is a law which provides for punitive damages. For the arbitrator, the objective of deterrence is very far from its concerns. What is before him is two parties. And his feeling of justice is that the damages must compensate the loss and not make the wrongdoer poorer and the victim richer. Is there something to be done? If the parties have not made a choice of the applicable law, the arbitrator can choose another law than the one which provides for uh, punitive damages. So he will avoid the problem. Bertolt Goldman used to say one of the criterions which an arbitrator can use when choosing the law he will apply consists in a comparison between the respective terms of the laws which have a connection with the case. So for him, that's legitimate. One could even go further, but I'm not sure I would approve that. And choose the Lex Mercatoria. Punitive damages are certainly, certainly not part of Lex Mercatoria. Now, in the other hypothesis, if the parties have made a choice and the chosen law imposes punitive damages, there is still a possibility for the arbitrator to, de to declare that if he ordered the respondent to pay punitive damages, the award would be exposed to a risk of annulment or at least to the risk of re refusal of enforcement in countries where the respondent may have assets. At this point, I must mention a decision by the French Cour de Cassation of 1st December 2010, which decided concerning a, just, a, a judgment of the Supreme Court of California. First, that an award of punitive damages is not per se contrary to public policy. But second, the assessment is different where the amount awarded is manifestly disproportionate to the loss and to the breach of contractual obligations. In the specific case, the punitive damages ordered by the California court were just a little lower than the damages uh, compensating the loss. The loss. But the Cour Co de Cassation found that public policy had been violated and uh, that the uh, punitive damages were dis disproportionate. So the judgment was not recognized. And needless, needless to say, an award granting treble damages would not be recognized either. Could arbitra an arbitrator go, go further and say disproportionate punitive damages are against truly international public policy or against my conscience? I prefer to leave this for the discussion. and turn to the case of contracts, 
which lead to extremely severe consequences for one party. That can often be avoided simply by applying a legal rule. For instance, if the party was the victim of a fraud, the contract may be about the null. Or if the excessive consequences result from a change of circumstances which could not be predicted. In many countries, there is what is called in French, théorie de l'imprécision, and there are more or less equivalent theories in other countries. But that does not always work. I remember a case in which, if the contract was strictly applied, a whole sector of industry would collapse in the most unfair way. And the tribunal managed to convince the parties to settle it. And they settled. And the disaster was avoided. And I think that was a great achievement. There are also certain types of clauses that sometimes make the, make the arbitrator uncomfortable. For instance, clauses which reduce the statute of limitation to a period extremely short, too short, or clauses limiting the liability. And when the loss is huge, the limit resulting from the clause is totally out of proportion and the arbitrator would like to do something. Or, last example, contractual penalties in case, in case of breach. When the way these penalties are calculated leads in the circumstance to a disproportionate amount. If the applicable law gives the judge, and why not the arbitrator, the possibility to correct the result, fine. And concerning contractual penalties, there is such a provision in the French Civil Code. The penalty can be reduced if it's manifestly excessive. But that does not exist, for instance, uh, in Swiss law. And what if the law does not offer any possibility? All I can say is this. The arbitrator, on the spur of his sense of equity, should be particularly attentive to the ways proposed by the party who, will, who would suffer, but he must not cheat with the law. My last comment on justice as a corrective factor can apply both to a law which would lead to a result considered unjust and to contract leading to such a result. It relates to the principle of proportion proportionality. If arbitrators are allowed to have recourse to that principle, which maybe would belong to the Lex Mercatoria or transnational law or some other legal order, they can most often make their sense of justice, of equity, prevail. It has been used in an exit award in an investment case, Occidental versus Ecuador, the award is dated uh, 5 October 2012. So you will be able to judge whether you would like it or not. There was, in that case, a concession contract between Occidental and Ecuador for the exploitation of oil fields. In the contract, in conformity with the hydrocarbons law of Ecuador, there was a clause pursuant to which the investor was not allowed to transfer all or part of its right to a third party, except if specifically authorized to do so by the government. And the sanction in the law and in the contract was, if there was a breach, termination of the contract, caducidad. The investor, Occidental, transferred secretly an, imp an important share of the concession to another investor that was hidden 
from the government. When the government discovered that, it pronounced caducida. Occidental started an exceptional arbitration against Ecuador, invoking the fair and equitable clause of the treaty between the United States and Ecuador, saying it had been unfairly treated. The arbitral tribunal found that the termination of the contract was a disproportionate sanction for what the investor had done. There was, therefore, violation of the duty of fair and equitable treatment. Having been one of counsel for Ecuador I, in that case, I was not convinced by the reasoning, but of course I am partial and I would be interested in your views. I come now to my conclusion. In one sense of the word justice, justice is the goal which every arbitrator wants to achieve. The award must grant to each party what is exactly due to it, based on the fact as and on a correct application of the law. But that goal is challenged by various obstacles of a procedural na nature, some imaginary, some real. Here, one can observe differences between arbitrators. The two extremes are, for some, justice must always prevail. For others, these procedural obstacles must be taken seriously, even at the risk that the award may not co coincide with reality. Another cause of disturbance results from a different notion of justice, which one may call equity. Equity is an important value. Human beings are normally sensitive to equity. But the will to avoid injustice in that sense can only play, in my opinion, a marginal role. It is normal that the arbiter takes it into account, but only in exceptional circumstances can equity really prevail? Generally speaking, what the parties expect is predictability, and they do not always trust the sense of equity, equity of the arbitrator. The principle for me, therefore, remains in his search of justice, the arbitrator must respect the terms of the contract and correctly apply the applicable law. Thank you for the uh, patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, uh, I find your your speech so rich that it is difficult to to take one single topic to to start discussion, but. Before giving the floor to the, our guests, uh, I would like to introduce him. And um, just recalling the, the, our idea, with the, the idea in, in this um, Science Paul Meyer Brown arbitration lecture is not to have a sequence of uh, different uh, speeches, but to have just discussion about the different topics uh, our lecturer has raised. That is quite <laughs> challenging for you, but uh, I hope you will uh, take this, the, this way to, to debate. Mm -hmm. So you are expected to, to have several interventions, short, very short interventions on different topics. And for that, we have uh, the, the, the pleasure to, to gather today uh, around Pierre, um, different persons, but all with a particular profile to, to debate uh, with Pierre. The first one uh, is Jennifer, uh, who is an independent arbitrator from the US, but uh, with habitual residence in Paris, if we can say that now. She is now in, in New York and for an uh, 
international arbitration uh, like her, it's very difficult to find sometimes uh, a particular or exclusive arbitral resident. Uh, before creating her own practice, Jennifer worked in, in several law firms. The last was, I think, Trevor Smith, but I am not sure of that. But, uh, um, and she was also Deputy Secretary General at the ITC Court of International Arbitration. <laughs> Currently, Jennifer acts as an arbitrator in complex cases under the aegis of almost all the most important arbitration institutions. Um, we have also uh, Stephanie Smart uh, Pinelli, who is the director of litigation at the Orano Group. Uh, after working on arbitration in different law firms, the, the last was Altana, I think. Mm -hmm. In this case, in Brazil, um, uh, with a particular specialization in construction, telecommunications, and innovation. Now she is more in, in this big group, Orano, uh, with many cases of litigation and arbitration <coughs> at her job. And um, the other guest is well known in our uh, discussions. Uh, we abused a little bit of his gener generosity and, and he invited him uh, in, in many occasions. It's Mathieu de Bossisson. Uh, as you know, he has acted in different capacities in several hundreds of arbitration uh, in all parts of the world. He has been a partner of Dahua and also the head of uh, arbitration in Linglators. He has given lectures and conferences uh, in on international arbitration in, in various universities all over the world. And now he's an independent uh, arbitrator. And last but not least, he's the author of the Les Droits Français de l'Arbitrage Interne International, uh, which is in the third edition, if I am not wrong. So, you can. <laughs> please. Uh, and also, Danny, of course, you are invited to, to jump in in the debate uh, whenever you, you wish. We have also questions uh, from the chat, several. I, I, I have already seen one from uh, a young student called George Berman from New York. And uh, please, I, I, I would like to have a quite free debate, uh, but I will be strict in, in, in the respect of time, very short interventions. And the first one maybe is just the first uh, reactions maybe on, on, on the notion of justice, but please feel free in what is the first reaction for, for you? Who is to start? Uh, Stephanie? Um, thank you very much again for inviting me. I'm, I'm really very honored to be here. Um, my first reaction would be that it was really, really very interesting. Thank you, Professor. And it's quite uh, reassuring to know that you didn't want to commit yourself. So if Professor Mayer didn't want to commit herself, I'm not sure I can commit myself either. But in any case, um, I strongly believe uh, that something maybe that wasn't said enough, if I may, is maybe my opinion as a general counsel is that arbitration is a choice uh, versus uh, choosing to go to what we call public justice, and if parties decide to choose arbitration, uh, it might appear simplistic, but they really want to choose to have a personalized justice, and for sure they don't want to have a mute arbitrator. And I really think this is important, and I believe my understanding and apprehension of justice in the scope of this uh, talk is made by comparison to the definition of justice before a national, I would say, judge, and maybe also before a mediator. So when I thought about preparing this um, conference, of course, I was in the, in the first stage thinking about ph philosophical um, definitions. But in fact, I, I tried to be as pragmatic as possible, and I tried to compare my vision of justice in the scope of arbitration, in the scope of mediation, and in the scope of um, a judicial um, trial. So I would be happy to, to discuss further later, but this is my first um, thought, I believe. Thank you. Jennifer? Um, well, 
I, I just I have to begin by saying thank you very much, Pierre, for your wonderful talk. It's always such a pleasure to hear you speak, and it's always so thought provoking. Um, what I would say is I appreciate the sort of overarching conclusion that uh, Pierre drew in his talk, particularly about this issue of equity being a sort of marginal uh, issue of justice that, that arbitrators can turn to periodically. And Pierre gave us many examples of how arbitrators may, in certain circumstances, want to bring in elements, be they evidentiary elements or ideas of equity, that the parties either haven't focused on or haven't raised, et cetera. And, and I think that, that in Pierre's talk, he very deftly set out different scenarios that, that, are, uh, that do actually arise in practice um, and gave us you know, a very good roadmap to how to think about those different situations. But for me, the kind of um, what I might say overarching principle in these situations is, is, is sort of one of humility on the part of the arbitrator. I, I, in my experience, the parties, of course, do expect to have a lot of control over how cases are presented, what arbitrators consider, et cetera. And that's kind of the starting premise. But I also agree with Pierre that there can be situations where an arbitrator feels appropriately that certain issues need to be raised or taken into consideration. But that really should be done with uh, a sense of humility that the arbitrator doesn't necessarily know uh, that, that what they're thinking is the right thing, doesn't necessarily understand perhaps why parties have not raised a certain issue that, that seems relevant to the arbitrators. Sometimes parties intentionally avoid raising certain issues for very practical reasons, so one has to be very careful when proceeding down these types of roads. Um, but what I really appreciated was the kind of balance that Pierre struck in his talk when, when considering sort of these different tensions that, that can arise in practical situations and cases. Thank you. Mathieu? Yes, uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, to uh, express my thanks to Mayor Brown, to all of you, to David, to Diego, and uh, to the others, thank you very much for this very kind of invitation for the second time. So I'm very honored and, and very, very pleased uh, to participate uh, with Pierre, with uh, our friend Pierre, so talented. It's uh, always a, a great pleasure and an intellectual exercise, which is extremely fascinating. And, uh, and Stephanie and you, Jennifer, thank you very much. Uh, my first remark uh, would be to say that um, I, 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 was, um, I, I was fascinated by this idea, which has been expressed perhaps in different uh, words by Pierre, uh, about the notion of justice. What is said, uh, broadly speaking, in that uh, justice in, is a goal, uh, it is an ideal, that is to say it is something which does not exist, which not, is, is nothing... No, which is not realized. And uh, the feeling of justice is the feeling of a gap, of a gap between a certain state of the proceedings, uh, the decisions to be taken, etc., and the goal of justice. And the problem is to uh, become aware of this gap, this inexistence of justice, and how to a certain extent to fill the gap. Well, Pierre has proposed a methodology uh, to, to, to fill the gap, if I may use this word. And this is, of course, and he has uh, dealt with uh, a certain number of topics. I agree with him to a certain extent on various points. I personally disagree with others. But nevertheless, coming back to the first stage, I agree with him about this this gap, the existence of this gap. An example in France has been given, Pierre has not referred uh, to that, but it is a very interesting example of uh, an, an ambit, a limited ambit of an arbitration agreement, which uh, shows a gap with justice. It is the question of an arbitration agreement 
under which the parties have agreed on the principle of the arbitration, but without agreeing on the constitution of the mechanism constitution of the arbitral tribunal, where there is a risk of denial of justice. And it is the famous case in France in York, the, 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 the Supreme Court by the Court of Cassation, where the French judge has taken the decision uh, in view of uh, this denial of justice in a foreign country to recognize itself competent to constitute the arbitral tribunal. So this is, this is an, an, an example which is, uh, which is uh, extremely, uh, uh, in my view, interesting. And my last remark, but we may, we may have discussions about, about that, of course. It is um, the first part of, uh, about the first part of Pierre's presentation in which he says that uh, in the name of justice, we have, or the arbitral, uh, the arbitral tribunal should be led to overcome a certain number of procedural obstacles. And he furnished examples of that in order to render a more just award. But my we are going to discuss in detail that my, my, primary, uh, my primary reaction would be to say exactly what Stephanie has said, is that the parties have made a choice about the arbitration process. That is to say, a procedure, a procedure with its rules, its requirements. And for instance, the fact that the dispute, the, the, the elements uh, the disputes consist of is the, the work of the parties, is controlled, is mastered by the parties. So in my view, to just an example, it would be perhaps dangerous to imagine that in name of reality, in name of uh, a substantive truth, I use the word used by, 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 uh, by Pierre, in the name of uh, the notion of reality, in the name of notion of substantive truth, which are also a notion extremely difficult to define, an arbitra uh, 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 the arbitrator might include new facts or, uh, or lead the parties to include new facts within the limits of the disputes. I know that Pierre has not suggested that exactly, but certainly a topic to be, to be discussed. Well, thank you very much to all of you to part in participating in this uh, stimulating debate. To, to add to, um, I think, the, the general idea that you were mentioning, I thought of another, listening to you, Professor Mayer, I thought of another obstacle, perhaps all of you can react to this, another obstacle to um, what you were presenting in the search for justice or a certain justice upon uh, rendering a decision, an arbitral decision, and that is whether this can become at a certain stage artificial. You've all uh, drafted awards, and I was wondering whether a looking for justice when the parties do not provide the right tools, but you feel that there is something there, it becomes a construction which is perhaps artificial and therefore shifts away or drifts away from uh, the search for justice. And I was wondering whether you've all encountered the situation of artificiality when looking for the application of justice. Um, many remarks. <laughs> um, well, first question is what do the parties really expect? Uh, my neighbors say uh, the, they do not expect the arbitrator to uh, behave as a tribunal, uh, state court uh, would, and they expect maybe uh, more uh, equity. Uh, well, I've not spoken with a sufficient number of uh, counsel for big companies to be certain about what they really expect. Of course, they expect, they, for them, very often, mediation is uh, preferable to state justice and even arbitration. And I, I would agree that in mediation, the notion of what is equitable uh, and reasonable uh, 
uh, is extremely important uh, and maybe must prevail. On the hand, my feeling is that in arbitration, uh, what the parties expect is that the arbitrator applies, applies the law. Because for, for the reasons I, I said, predictability and some distrust in the sense of equity of the uh, arbitrators. I may, be your, I may be wrong, maybe there should be an inquiry uh, and uh, the question would be asked to many, many um, general counsel of uh, big uh, or, or small um, companies. What do you really expect? Do you prefer equity to the strict application of the law? Ah, okay. So I said, what is my understanding? Maybe Trump, maybe Trump. Um, do they also expect that the party, that the arbitrator be passive, or uh, if uh, the arbitrator sees something which he finds important that has not been uh, mentioned by uh, the parties, do they expect that the arbitrator stay passive, not ask any question, or the opposite, or the opposite? Um, here again, I'm not certain what they really want. Um, but as an arbitrator, seeing, I take the example which I initially gave, uh, an, an example which I have lived, uh, seeing in the contract a clause which almost obviously, 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 uh, changing completely, completely uh, the, um, the outcome of the case, I cannot resist asking the question. With the question. Maybe, as uh, Jennifer, Jennifer said, um, the uh, parties have a good reason not to mention the clause. Well, they're not obliged to answer. They make they may answer, we do not think, both parties would say, we do not think that this clause has a, any role to play, and then the arbitrator will not instinct, in, insist. So there's no harm, in my opinion, there's no harm. Um, as to um, the um, NIOC, case mentioned by uh, Mathieu, um, this notion of denial of justice, justice here is taken in the first sense that I mentioned in the introduction, which is the obligation to study the case and render an award. And the attitude of is Israel blocked that. Um, the only question, and the, 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 the decision by the Cour de Cassation inspired the legislator in one of the articles of the uh, Code of Civil Procedure now, the notion that uh, an arbitrator has jurisdiction if it's the only way to avoid denial of justice, uh, that, of course, was, was very important. I did not mention it, but uh, I thank uh, Mathieu for, for mentioning it. Um, what am I forgetting? Um, maybe no, nothing else from you. Um, no, no I, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's OK. The, the, um, before giving the floor uh, again to, to our guest, um, I, I take advantage because some of the questions in the, in the chat are um, clearly dealing with the same thing. Uh, one said, you have, you have mentioned that this idea of if the arbitrator should uh, ask questions that the party has not raised about issues that parties have not raised. And one of our attendances Henry Yacoub uh, 
as but that includes criminal issues. Can an arbitrator or should an arbitrator raise the, the, the questions about probable criminal issues? The, the arbitrator should not change the scope of the dispute. I mean, the, what is claimed and what is denied. Uh, that's reserved to the parties. So he must not ex extend the scope of the uh, dispute that is brought before the Bopper. I think that also answered the uh, George Berman question, because the question of George Berman was what happens with the Council has neglected a claim, not an argument. So that is, I think you have already answered. More issues? No, I, would, I would just uh, repeat that uh, <laughs> the uh, definition of the claims is the real of the claimants. And of course, for counterclaims, the respondents. Uh, the uh, arbitrator cannot extend the scope of the uh, uh, arbitration, even if he or she thinks that it would have been uh, clever and reasonable by the claimant to make a certain claim, which he not, did not make, but the uh, arbitrator here cannot interfere. Okay. You can change the order, Matthew. Um, I, I think we, we, we all agree uh, with Pierre. I think I, I completely agree with Pierre. My, my, my objection was a question to him, and he, I think he has answer. If I may allow to give an example, for instance, let's assume that there is a dispute uh, between the parties regarding the sale, uh, the sale, the acquisition, the sale of a group of companies, for instance, and the price of the of the uh, of the. Uh, the, the price of the, of the sale. There is the dispute about, for instance, net assets. I don't know what the accounting disputes, the, the assessment of the price, the termination of price. If, for instance, the parties have referred to uh, uh, um, some, some methodologies, for instance, the comparison you know, of the, the value of companies uh, in the same sector, or the methodology of the of the of the net, the net active of the company, uh, these kind of things. I don't think that the, the arbitral tribunal might um, suggest to the parties to use, for instance, the DCF methodology regarding the business plans and the future flows from the activities of the company, because just because it is not within the ambit of the claims and the argument from the parties. And there is this uh, very old proverb in, 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 the, in, in France and in the civil law countries, but I don't think it could be denied by our friend from the, the common law traditions. It is, uh, give, me, give me facts, I will give you law. Uh, da me factum, um, than uh, factum TB dabo use, and and this is a fundamental rule in my view, that that the, the party remain the master of of the facts and the elements uh, constitutive of the dispute. I agree with you. In your example, uh, the the way to de to determine the price is part of the claim. And, you, and the yes. arbitrator cannot change it and cannot even suggest yes. that it could be, could be framed differently. Um, as to uh, Damihi Factum, uh, the parties have given the arbitrator the whole contract. And so it's part of the case. The whole contract is part of the case. The arbitrator, in my opinion, and I, I know that there are two uh, schools on this. Uh, in my opinion, the arbitrator, as the judge, because the judge un undoubtedly can and does ask questions on something which is in the, the file, and particularly in the contract, on which he, he wants he wants to know more. There's even an article, I think it's article 
seven, seven or eight in the Code of Civil Procedure that allows the court, the, uh, a court to do that. And why not the arbitrator? And, and why the arbitrator? Because that's my position. Because arbitrate, the arbitrators wants to do justice. I know that justice is uh, not, uh, does not belong to this world. It's an ideal, maybe, but an injustice is something that belongs to this world and that should be avoided if possible. And if to make it possible, it suffices to ask a question, I think that should be done. <laughs> Maybe a, a question to, uh, trying to, to, to ask a question to all of you. I'm, I'm in a lucky situation where I don't have to answer the question, but perhaps asking you a few, which came to my mind while looking at the title of our of our topic today, and I will welcome views from all of you as you know, as a general counsel, arbitrator, counsel, and you appoint arbitrators. Would the title be different if it would say, "Must justice be a goal for the presiding arbitrator as opposed to the co-arbitrators?" And I was wondering if there is a difference in the approach to justice or the tools used to get to a decision in terms of justice, if you are a co-arbitrator as opposed to a president. Perhaps the general counsel, upon selecting a co-arbitrator, would consider justice slightly differently. Perhaps you, as an arbitrator, would do so as well, if you're a co-arbitrator, or when you appoint um, a counsel, uh, when you appoint arbitrator, you would take into consideration a different sense of justice. Is that the case, or am I just uh, making it up? This is, it is a question in the chat also, so it is a oh, <laughs> very good. Okay, if, if I may, um, indeed it is. It is definitely uh, something important, I believe. Uh, I only represent my company, but I believe this is really important. And again, I'm, I'm talking about this choice we're making, and I make a lot of that about choice. And uh, for instance, Ohano is in the energy uh, industry. It's a very technical industry. And for sure, it's really essential for us that we have um, an arbitral uh, tribunal that will be composed by person having different sensitivities and sensibilities uh, to the law and to the justice. Because I precisely do believe, uh, contrary to what um, you think, Professor Mayor, of course, uh, what the parties expect is that the arbitrator or the tribunal will apply the law. But I think it's really about balance. And I really think my personal opinion is, is that I would rather have a proactive arbitrator because uh, you're, you're saying, Mathieu, that um, the parties that are the masters of facts, uh, and if you give the facts, the arbitrator will apply the law. Uh, but before applying the law, he has to qualify the facts. And I believe he has to have a very wide view on the facts to be able to qualify and have justice. So again, to there are several questions, of course, and everything is very linked. But in order to, able, to be able to qualify, I think it's very interesting to have different um, competences in the tribunal because all of them will not necessarily qualify in the same. They will not, maybe not have the same vision of justice. So, of course, it's really, really, it's the main choice for us is choosing the arbitrator because uh, we know where we want to go. We know what is our conception of justice, and it might appear simplistic, but from one case to another, maybe our, our vision of justice will be different. And I have been a lawyer for a long time, and I have been the one choosing, uh, changing mine from the morning to the afternoon, depending on the case I was defending. I could defend two different justices, in fact. And I strongly believe that uh, a lawyer has to defend the justice of his clients. Now my justice is quite more the same every day. Uh, my justice is the justice of my industry. is an, it's, It is an economical justice, so it's very different. The exercise is different, so my views are different. And today, I really think I need to have a complex tribunal and to have um, people having a different views in order to have a better justice. Again, it's um, spontaneous, but... Pierre, do you have any reactions? Yes. To this? Well, uh, <laughs> now, if you want to have to appoint a proactive 
arbitrator, mm -hmm. while being proactive, uh, essentially means asking questions. Mm -hmm. So, to in the debate we, we just had, I think that's an argument mm -hmm. uh, for the possibility for the three arbitrators to ask questions. And particularly, I would accept that the co-arbitrator, if I am appointed by you as a co-arbitrator, <laughs> I will try not to miss the questions which would help your case. And probably the other arbitrator will, uh, will ask the questions that will help his appointment's case. Um, that being said, uh, the, the notion of justice that the party has is not necessarily the notion that the arbitrator appointed by that party has. Um, we must not be hypocritical. I, I accept that when you are appointed as a co-arbitrator, you know what is expected of you. That's in your mind. And you are always happier if the party which has appointed you wins than if it loses. I, I remember having said that in a, in a conference, and I remember Hildehans was shocked by that. But I must say that I've always observed that. But that does not mean that I will help that party. I will be, of course, vigilant. That there's a duty of vigilance as a co-arbitrator. But, I mean, for me, the limit is precisely the following. In the deliberation, I will not make an argument that I know is not correct. Mm -hmm. It's, in fact, intellectual honesty that leads you to be just as a co-arbitrator. You must be intellectually honest. Just a, yeah, <laughs> then I stop. But what I would say is if I choose you, it's because you would know my industry, for instance. It's not because you would give right to my claim. It's because you would know and be sensitive to what I'm doing and understand what happened and how the contract was performed. And this is, and this is why I would choose you. And the second thing, uh, I would say, sorry, I lost it. I will come back. Do you have other opportunities? Yeah. No problem. Jennifer, do you, do you have something on this point or another point? Um, yeah, I'll jump in on this point and, and particularly on, on Danny's question and uh, the comments that Pierre has made about it. The only observation I would make is that um, in theory, at least, there's not supposed to be much of a difference between co-arbitrators and the chairman. They're all supposed to be neutral, independent, et cetera. Um, though I take Pierre's point about, um, you know, understanding what's expected of you in the role of a co-arbitrator. And I do think that any co-arbitrator worth appointing has that in their minds, among other things. But I would also note that as a co-arbitrator, it's very rare for a co-arbitrator to dissent against a decision that goes in favor of the party that nominated them. And I, I would admit that as a co-arbitrator, if the chairman wanted to, wanted to make a ruling in favor of the party that nominated me, it would have to be really, really, really wrong <laughs> before I would say, absolutely not. We can't do that. And usually in the context of an arbitration, whatever rulings have to be made, be they procedural or substantive on the merits of the case, usually th there's a range of possible reasonable answers. Um, there are cases that are black and white, there are issues that are black and white, and those are blessedly easy, but often they aren't. Often, I think Rusty Park talks about rendering decisions that are uh, that, that reflect a reasonable interpretation of the facts in the law, you know, that we aren't aspiring to some kind of justice or truth that would be in, in the mind of an omnipotent God or something like this. Uh, and when we operate on this level that we necessarily must as humans, this more humble level, there usually are a range of potentially reasonable answers. And I think as a co-arbitrator, it would just be very 
it would require a lot for me to want to go against a chairman that that wanted to rule in favor of the party that nominated me. I, I would say that. Um, Jenny, first, I, I must say, because I don't know if I had the opportunity before, that I always like what you write when you send me what you have written. And uh, that's a good transition to say that I entirely agree with what you've just said. Uh, one must be humble. And there are many, very, very often situations in which you hesitate. I often hesitate. But after having hesitated, I come to a conclusion. I prefer this conclusion that to, uh, to this other one. But if the other two are of the opposite uh, opinion, the, op 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 the other two, including the chairperson, uh, then I'm humble. They may be right. Anyway, I am in a minority, and I must accept it. So I never draft dissenting opinions in any case. And particularly, of course, not against the party who has a point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on totally uh, other topic, but uh, I think you you focus on that in a part of your your uh, speech. I have a a question from someone I think you know quite well, called Silva Romero, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "Can the proportionality principle?" somewhat override the Pacta Sumiservanda rule, especially within the Lex Mercatoria in commercial arbitration or the fair and equitable treatment standard in investment arbitration. No, I, I know that Eduardo has the same feeling uh, that I expressed about the award uh, in the uh, Occidental Ecuador case because we were cancelled together, and we were both disappointed uh, with the uh, recourse to the principle of proportionality that the tribunal uh, used. And uh, more generally, and, and it was, uh, well, no, I won't say more because uh, I respect the arbitrators, okay, even if they were wrong. Um, and, but I honestly say I was on one side, okay. Um, Generally speaking, generally speaking, uh, I think this principle of proportionality can give you a total liberty of deciding any way. You don't like what the uh, result of the application of the law to the facts is. Well, you said that's contrary to the principle of proportionality. I'll do something else. That's not serious. That's the total lack of pred predictability. So I'm not in favor of that. Thank you. That's different when and, and, uh, it's a, uh, a principle which is applied that by the European Court of Human Rights, because it's a totally different context. Any other opinion question? Um, Yes, on the, on the proportionality principle, yes, it is um, to a certain extent, this, uh, in, in matters of uh, contractual liability, the, the proportionality has been, I think, referred to as a principle of international trade law uh, by some, uh, some awards. Nevertheless, at the same time, um, when parties to an international contract make a choice for a law applicable to the contract, and that this law, for instance, provides a possibility of punitive damages, I, I think the, the, the arbitral tribunal should also be careful not to be dis, uh, disrespectful of the consequences of this choice. It is, of course, a difficult balance to strike from time to time. But um, uh, uh, regarding punitive damages, um, there are there are there are not many decisions, in my view. But I'm I'm, I'm speaking about the court of Pierre, 
uh, refusing the enforcement of uh, decisions or awards uh, uh, rather in another country because this would be contrary to the proportionality principle. It seems, it seems to me that uh, the, 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 the arbitral tribunal is also, to a certain extent, it is a, a, a very uh, difficult matter, a, a different matter, which is the question of the status of the, of the, of the arbitrator and to what extent uh, the arbitrator, the international arbitrator, is also the guardian of the law uh, chosen by the parties. Or other laws applicable, for instance, uh, mand mandatory laws, etc., etc. So it, it's not only um, a recourse uh, to uh, apply or to make applicable the uh, the contract and the provisions of the contract. He is also, to a certain extent, the guardian of uh, the, the 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 law which is uh, the law applicable uh, to, the, to the dispute, either by, by choice from the parties or by choice from the, the arbitral tribunal. But I don't know if Pierre would agree with that. I think so. Uh, when you say uh, punitive damages, do you refer to uh, punitive damages uh, in the law or in the contract? Penalties in the contract. I, I would say, I would say, I would say both. For, for, mm -hmm. for instance, in, in matter of antitrust law in the United States, I remember, for instance, the Westinghouse, the famous Westinghouse case, which is a very old case, but it's very interesting, and where uh, decisions has been rendered with punitive damages, they has been enforced in the on the French territory, if I well, well remember. I wrote an opinion in that case. Yes. <laughs> Whether the the, Ameri the U.S. law was a loi de police yes. or not. Yes. Um, no. If so, speaking of punitive da damages ordered by the applicable law, um, the way to escape that, which I suggested earlier, uh, I I approve it. Uh, this is. If it's disproportionate, at least, at least if it's disproportionate, uh, my award risks not being enforced in many countries. So that's a good reason what, not to apply it. My, my goal with being that I don't like it in arbitration because it's unfair. There's a, a, a goal of deterrence in the law, but that has not, nothing to do with the case of these two parties, uh, the dispute of whom I have to decide. Uh, as to uh, penalties in case of breach of contract provided for in the contract, I'm very happy that under French law, uh, there is a possibility to open reduce. to the judge and for me to the arbitrator to reduce uh, penalties which are manifestly excessive. And I've been extremely unhappy yes. in a certain case, when I, which was under French law, when I could not convince my co the other co-arbitrators, which is the chairperson and the other co-arbitrator, uh, to apply that provision uh, and all, all I obtained was a reduction when it was, I mean, these penalties were huge, completely disproportionate. I obtained a dis, dis, uh, reduction by 10%, which of course means nothing, but it, because if it's manifestly excessive, it will still be manifestly excessive if you reduce it by 10%. You are, you, are applying, you are applying the proportionality principle. Because the I law, yes, no, no, I don't like, <laughs> no, I don't like, the, uh, I should have been more precise. I don't like the proportionality principle as a way for the arbitrator to do what he would like to do, although it's not provided either by the contract or by the law. On the other hand, 
it's very useful in certain rules of law. And I like it. I mean, I like Article 1152 of the French Civil Code. Uh, we, if I may just um, um, recall that, that we have recently in the, in the French, um, rendered by the French court, by the Paris court and the, and the Supreme Court in France in the 2010 and 2012, uh, decisions about the assessment of damages and without necessarily the presence of uh, uh, private penalty clauses, which ob obviously might uh, may be reduced. But the, the courts consider that the arbitrators are completely free to make the assessments they deem appropriate without assimilating their decision to an ex equo and bono decision. Uh, decision. They, they are not supposed to, to, to behave like ex equo and, and bono arbitrators. They, they, they are not ex equo and bono arbitrators. And, 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 and nobody can blame them for that. But they are free to make the assessment on the, the basis of their personal uh, feelings of the case, which is uh, interesting jurisprudence. I think that, it, uh, uh, that Pierre uh, agreed with, with that. Yes, anyway, uh, the, the French conception of the determination of damages is what, how the uh, tribunal, the, the court even, feels and how the arbitrator feels. And uh, this is not necessarily the best uh, position because um, it is too easy to say I'm not going to spend too much time on this complex construction case to determine exactly what the loss is. I think we should rather imitate the common law courts, which take damages very seriously. And that leaves not so much room for the feeling of the arbitrator. I agree. You, you have mentioned uh, expectation of the parties, and, and uh, there are some questions on, on this, uh, because uh, when the parties selected a law, and the, we had a discussion in a uh, recent event in, in, in Sciences Po uh, between Pierre Tercier and Sylvain Boulay on this point, uh, which, which is the, the expectation of the party. The party have selected Swiss law. They are expecting the, the, the Swiss law to be applied. But what happens if the arbitrators uh, think or are convinced that the concrete uh, answer of Swiss law in this case is in this case is unjust. This is not really appropriated for the case. So that is which is a threshold to, to disregard the, the law the selected by the parties. Um, this is a very difficult point, uh, illustrated by Article 404 of the Swiss uh, Code of Obligations mm -hmm. uh, concerning uh, the uh, mandate. Um, a case, uh, an article which uh, annuls a clause that the parties wished to introduce in the contract. What should prevail? The, the uh, rule of law of the chosen law which annuls the clause or the clause which more closely reflects the, the, the will and the expectations of the parties. Uh, I think that I, I have hesitated long on this. I have come to the conclusion that the clause should not be annulled. But it, it's less easy uh, than people generally think. Any further questions you can make? <clears throat> just just a, a feeling. We were talking about uh, being humble and humility, and a legislator cannot raise all the issues in his law. So I believe that humility is also on this side. And um, here the arbitrator can be complementary, maybe, to the legislator and believe that maybe in this specific case, the law hasn't went, uh, hasn't gone far enough to cover this issue. 
And here, I believe, when I'm talking about the proactive arbitrator, this arbitrator would consider that, indeed, uh, he's not going against the essence of the law by being a bit creative. Uh, and and this, is, this, this was my thought, but by listening to you, I fully agree with everything you said. And it made me think about the humility of, towards the legislator and the fact that men of law should be complementary at some stage in order to um, go forward toward justice. And justice should be a, a common goal for everybody, for the parties, for the, the legislator, for the arbitrator, for the judge. And uh, I believe they should be complementary regarding your question. Well, the, the role of the judge and the arbitrator is to interpret the law. And, and there's a certain latitude. And, and of course, the, the judge and the arbitrator will try to interpret the law in the uh, fairest sense. But if there's no way to interpret the law in the sense you think fair, and you make your uh, feeling of fairness prevail over any possible interpretation of the law, then you violate the law. Am I not against it? Jennifer, you have any further comments or questions? Well, I confess that fortunately, I have never actually personally had this situation where the parties have agreed on a certain law. So we're, we're putting to one side these cases that Pierre, I think, very carefully carved out where there has not been an agreement on the law. I think those throw up, uh, and so the arbitrator is actually determining the rules of law that are going to apply. I think that throws up perhaps more uh, delicate scenarios. I, I have not had this situation where the parties agree upon the law um, and then, I look at how the law would be applied to the facts that have been established and feel that it's just manifestly unjust and I don't want to apply the law. I, I have fortunately avoided that situation thus far. I mean, I have to say that as an arbitrator where the parties have agreed upon the law that is to be applied, uh, and not having had Pierre's experience, it's, it's almost hard for me to imagine a scenario where I would not apply the law that had been agreed by the parties. I mean, again, we're, we're talking, when we're talking about seeking justice in a way that somehow departs from the law that the parties have agreed or somehow departs from the evidence that's on the file or somehow departs from uh, the cases as they've been presented, et cetera, we're, we're really talking about what I would consider to be situations where they do come up, fortunately they come up relatively rarely, and we just need to tread very, very carefully when going out into these areas. Um. I, once again, I, I agree with you, um, but I accepted after hesitation to make an exception in the case which Diego uh, presented, uh, in which the, there is in the contract a certain clause, substantive clause, and a clause of choice of law. And the law chosen, Swiss law in, in in several cases, in fact, uh, says this clause is void. Um, it's a very spe special situation because you can say, what is the real expectation and the real will of the parties? Is it that Swiss law be applied and an elder clause or the clause and that it be applied? So. Hesitantly, I've come to the conclusion that it's better to apply the clause, which means not applying the Swiss law, which would annul it. But that, that's uh, it's an exception that I accept, accept. But my, but my general view is 
the arbitrator must apply the law, which shocks, I see, many people, uh, <laughs> particularly because of the title of my uh, presentation. I, I suppose everybody thought equity, 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 and that's not uh, on that uh, aspect that I insisted. I mean, the, the, only, the only thing I would add... The essential is that, I mean, sum quique tribuere. The, this party has a certain right. The arbitrator must give him that right. That's all. That, that's for, for me, that's the most important aspect of justice. And, it's, and it is threatened, and it is threatened by the various obstacles that I mentioned. Jennifer? Oh, the only, the only thing that I was going to add is that, um, you know, again, I haven't confronted the situation, though I, I think there's a lot of practical appeal to the approach Pierre took when he found himself in that particularly unusual situation. In part, what road to go down might also be affected by where you're sitting, I think, as arbitrator. Like, for example, in the United States, we do still have this manifest disregard of the law as a potential grounds for set aside of an award. I, I don't know uh, enough, you know, if Professor Berman is is watching, he may weigh in on this, but um, it's, you know, it throws, the situation that Pierre has described throws up a situation where effectively the arbitrator would be deciding, I'm just simply not going to apply the law the parties have agreed because the consequence would be to override the contract. And I just don't think that that's what the parties intended um, because why would somebody draft a contract with provisions that were overridden by the law applicable? They must have been unaware of how the law would operate with respect to these provisions of the contract. And I see that as a practical matter, but I just don't know, depending on the place of arbitration, whether that might throw up uh, difficulties for the enforceability of the award. Martin? Yes. Not, not about another subject, I have two little questions for, for, for Pierre, uh, which uh, he has not dealt with, but it seems to me that the, uh, these, uh, these topics were, were close to the notion of justice. The, the, the first topic is, it would be the equality uh, uh, between the parties, uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, linked to this notion of justice. And it, it seems to me that equality is not always uh, uh, really um, a success because in terms of justice, uh, uh, for instance, regarding the allocation of times, the time, the submissions, etc. But I would like to have the, the opinion of Pierre. The, sec the second topic, second question for Pierre is in case the, the parties have not made any choice of, law, of, uh, of a national, any national law applicable to the contracts or any rules of law, to, to what extent uh, the arbitrators may apply, which is recognized in France, but not uh, perhaps in other countries, may uh, apply uh, uh, transnational rules of law. Uh, what kind of definition might be given to that? And uh, I, I would like also to have your, uh, your view on that, because to a certain extent, we are we are continuing to, to talk about the notion of justice because the, arbit the arbitrators may have the idea that uh, tra uh, transnational rules, uh, uh, unit or principle, etc., might might be considered as expressing the idea of justice uh, which they are seeking. Um, to your first question, I, I agree with you. Um, um, because when one party has to cross-examine five witnesses and the other party has only to, to uh, cross-examine one or eight witnesses or, or experts to say you will have exactly the same amount of time for me is not, in fact, I would, I would have said first, is not just and even is not equal. Because equality is something more complex by dividing by two, the time by two. 
As to the second question, uh, I, as to a definition of uh, transnational law, lex mercatoria, of uh, arbitral legal order, I'm not competent. I'm not competent. Uh, <laughs> uh, some consider that lex mercatoria and arbitral legal order are the same thing. I thought I had understood they were different, so I prefer not to embark into these uh, distinctions. Um, as to whether it's a good idea sometimes for the arbitrator to apply lex mercatoria, if it's lex mercatoria without any uh, precision, additional precision, not so much in favor of that because lex mercatoria, you, you invent it as at the same time as you apply it. So I, I don't like it so much. But you mentioned principi di droit. I like them very much. They are written. You can apply them and they're good. They're the result of comparative studies between the best comparatists. I like them. Uh, I think it's enough. Uh, two hours is just too much <laughs> from here. <laughs> and, enough uh, for me. <laughs> uh, I, I really thank again uh, on behalf of uh, all the organizers, uh, Mario Brown and Sinspo Law School and, and the Sinspo Arbitration Society. Uh, I found this discussion really wonderful. Um, many people. Uh, agree with me, and uh, I receive all the time uh, congratulations for me, and uh, actually uh, for you and for the other. <laughs> you will transfer them for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and uh, I hope that the the in the next uh, edition, the third edition, uh, that for the uh, our guests will be really very difficult to to be in in, in this level. So the for the next one, it is quite really challenging. Uh, but thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you actually were the, the right person to discuss about this, and we are very happy. Thank uh, you very much you. again, Diego. <laughs> okay, thank you very much to all of you, to all the the, the guests, of course, and and uh, to all the attendants that were many many around the world, and you are all invited to the next event in October. It is a joint uh, conference between uh, NYU and Science Po uh, about the procedural issues in international arbitration. It is a called um, Intergenerational Arbitration Symposium. And there were young uh, practitioners uh, and scholars discussing with experienced ones like uh, such as um, uh, Piotr Sie or Julita Corderamos. So thank you very much. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.